Would you like to learn more about sewing loops than you probably wanted to? Check it out on this episode of How Not to Highline. Hi, I'm Ryan Jinks and welcome to my gear room. I just got back from Switzerland from the ISA meetings where one of the talks was from Stefan from Rad Slacklines. Rad Slacklines makes some rad gear. And so, the uh, Stefan brought up sewing loops. Now, if you follow Slack chat at all, you'll know that Stefan and I had a debate online about soft shackles on sewing loops. And so uh, it was super interesting to hear his research on sewing loops because I didn't realize he's got six months into it. He's done so many tests and uh, we'll go into why they do their uh, so in loops like this instead of the traditional bar tags, which is what this whole episode is about. This webbing is lift from Balance Community, and you can see it, it's got three, four, five, six, seven bar tags with, I believe, the 138 thread bonded. Um, this is Dyneema thread, it's a little bit thinner, and you're gonna hear all about why they chose this pattern. They have a machine that clamps uh, a certain space and does all of the sewing uh, on there and it's something they can standardize. Uh, so they had to be able to make the strongest possible stitch pattern with the space they had. Whereas bar tacks, you can just keep adding and adding and adding until it's strong enough. So check out the meeting from the ISA. Okay. Hi everybody. I'm Stefan from Red Slacklines. I think most of you know me by now. Um, I was asked to um, have a little talk about soon loops, soon connections in webbings. So I prepared some slides and some video footage for you uh, to show what's our recent uh, state in sewing webbings. I will show you some destructive tests and what it's about when we uh, sew webbings. Um, I'm slacklining since about 2012, founded Red Slacklines in about 2014. Um, and we started testing this loop stuff and sewing stuff at the beginning of this year. We did about 200 um, destructive tests of soon connections, soon loops during, this, uh, during the last seven, eight months. So we gained some little insight into this uh, topic and I'd like to share with you what we found out so far. Um, like the last year and the year before, I'd like to have a short break for us to take a look around in this room. I know we had some statistics today shown by Thomas that about 22-23% um, of uh, members of our community are female. I just uh, took a count today and it was like five girls, 25 guys, so it's like 16.6%. And I hope that we can make ourselves aware that we are not even close to where we should be right now and hopefully find some ways to improve this ratio. So um, what I'm gonna talk about today is how does sewing work. I'm gonna show you uh, some difference in yarns, needles, that you can use different sewing patterns, um, what stitch lengths, how all of these factors influence the strength of a loop, what's the difference in between several um, machine types, how we can um, enforce reproducibility of certain sewing patterns. And I will compare some loop styles like T-loops to Ravida loops. Um, and I'd like an open discussion about the topic, how we can connect soon pieces of webbings for big highline rigs. I think this uh, is the big issue in the room to see how we can um, get this going. And maybe in the end, we can talk about uh, soft shackles on soon loops, can discuss it a bit. I think Ryan has lots of words, words to say on this and me too. So I hope we will have a, a, an open discussion on all these issues and see how we can uh, find solutions for this. So how does sewing work in the first place? You usually have um, a layer of webbing or two layers of webbing that you want to have connected and you have a needle pushing into the webbing. You have an, an upper thread and a lower thread and you have a mechanism below so the needle connects two pieces of threads for the webbing, pulls them tight, knots them, 
and by this mechanism, these two layers of webbing are connected now. There are different kinds of yarns that can be used for sewing webbings. Uh, yarns is not, nothing else like a really, really small, really thin rope. And you can get them in different diameters, different strengths, like, like ropes. You can get them made from different materials. You can get them made from nylon, like polyester, from Teflon, or like uh, Danima. Uh, you can have them in different uh, twistings. You can have them bonded to each other so they don't uh, have this uh, single filaments getting apart while you sew. You can have them in different coatings. You can have them like Teflon coated so they uh, produce less friction while they go through the webbing and many more vari variables uh, just alone in the topic of yarns. So this is a, a big field uh, that can be, uh, lots of research can be put into this, just alone yarns to make um, a soon, soon connection uh, as strong as it is or weaker than it should be. The same goes for the issue of needles. There's many different needle uh, forms out there. You can have really uh, pointy needles, you can have uh, round tip needles, you can have really sharp needles. And this is the first big issue I'd like to address in this talk that um, when people ask us, how should my webbings be soon? Where can I bring my webbings to have them soon? Um, I've read it a lot on Slack chat and other Facebook groups that people recommend, yeah, you can go to a shoemaker, you can go to a sailmaker, you can go to some uh, people like this to have your webbings soon. What most sailmakers and what most shoemakers use are needles that are like little knives. They have like really sharp tips. And these tips, they are used for cutting into the leather because normal needles like these ones are not sharp enough to, to penetrate the leather and get through it. Um, but what happens when you bring your webbing to one of these sewing machines and have them sewn this way is that these sharp tips, they destroy the fiber connection of your webbings. So what you don't want is anyone to sew your webbings with such a needle because the webbing will definitely have a decreased strength afterwards it was soon with, with such kind of needle. The same goes for this needle tip. This is a really pointy needle and if you use such a needle you can have like in German it's called a uh, Laufmaschen. Um, you have like uh, the, the single filaments of your webbings are not aligned as perfectly as they uh, were aligned when they went out of the factory. So the way to go is needles with round tips. Uh, these don't destroy the webbing or they destroy the webbing the least way and are known to work best for sewing webbings. Uh, what's really important for needles when you sew webbings is that you should know that if you use a needle in a machine and you put it through the webbing again and again and again and again, like in this uh, pattern, it's like about 200 stitches. Every needle has um, wear. And when a needle wears off, the tip can become dull. And you can imagine that, that if a dull tip goes through the webbing and goes back up again, it will destroy the fibers. You won't necessarily see this, but of course this will uh, decrease the strength of the webbing. And the same goes for needles that are not obviously dull, but they are just worn out. You can see some microscope pictures down here. Uh, you can see that if the needle was used too often, or for too long uh, term, that the, the surface of the needle becomes quite rough and this also destroys the fiber structure of the webbings. So what you want from somebody who sues your webbing is that he changes the needles quite often to guarantee uh, the maximum uh, of strength from, uh, for your webbings. And the next point is sewing patterns. What I've read quite often on uh, Slack chat is, yeah, you could um, use a bar tech. You could use a bar tech with a certain kind of yarn and just have like six or eight or 10 of these bar techs and you're fine with it. Um, if you buy an, an industrial sewing machine, you will find that uh, by any standard industrial sewing machine that can um, sew Bartex, you will find like about 15 default Bartek patterns that are already programmed into this machine. So um, it's not like, yeah, just have somebody sue a Bartek, 
but it's also about have somebody sue the right Bartek. So you see like they have uh, a different number of stitches. So um, obviously they have a different strength in the end and they have different height and different distances between the stitches and all of these parameters um, can influence the strength of the sewing in the end and of course the, uh, the strength of the webbing that remains. So it's not just like, yeah, have some Bartek soon in the webbing with this yarn, but it's also uh, the right Bartek and the right size and the right distance to each other to um, guarantee the strength of the webbing afterwards. And there's even more patterns like uh, box stitches or cross stitches and something like this. So um, the, the topic of finding the right sewing pattern is a bit more complex than just um, sew a Bartek with this yarn. It's, it's, it's uh, a bit under complex uh, to state it this way. Um, in the uh, literature of, on ropes, uh, some years ago there was um, a graphic that showed a comparison of certain sewing patterns, sewing patterns uh, and compared their strength to each other. And you have like uh, Xbox stitches or uh, three bar tags and compare them to a uh, zigzag in the length axis um, soon on a webbing. And they found uh, already years ago that um, pattern that has a zigzag stitch on the length axis of the webbing uh, possibly remains the uh, most strength of a sewing pattern that can be sewn to a webbing. So what is important if you sew um, your webbings? It's important that you have the right stitch length too. You can vary in any sewing machine the length of a stitch. It means it's uh, the distance between two of these points where the needle penetrates the webbing and the distance that the yarn uh, goes for. So if you have um, your needle going right in here and going back in here, you don't have the fibers of your webbings connected to each other. You just put some hole into it, put some yarn into it, but the fibers of the webbing are not connected to each other. So what we want is we want a stitch in here. We want the next stitch in here. So we really connect the fibers of the webbing to each other so they can't move anymore when there's uh, tension on the line. So this brings, uh, brings us obviously to the problem how many stitches is the right number of stitches for sewing webbings. We did some tests. We are not finished with our tests yet. We have a pattern that you, most of you probably might have seen in some of our videos before on loops and on Durella Vida loops. Um, it's like a zigzag in a box and we can produce these pattern with different amount of stitches. Like when, what we see on the left side here is the same pattern with about 220 stitches. And on the right side, we have the same pattern with uh, bigger stitch length and about 140 stitches. And both of these patterns have different strengths. So um, it's important to know uh, if, we sew uh, if, we, if we sew our webbings, that we use the right stitching length to, um, to not weaken the webbing as much uh, as we can, but at the, at the same time bring as much yarn into, inside of the webbing so that we find the optimum point where the strength is at the optimum. Because any stitch obviously reduces the strength of the webbing and not enough stitches don't bring in enough of the yarn, so the yarn might break first. I will show this in um, some videos in some minutes. The next factor that obviously plays a big role in sewing webbings is the minimum breaking strength, uh, the base breaking strength of the webbing itself. If I have a webbing that's like 35 kilonewton strength, I will not be able to sew this webbing to a strength of 40 kilonewtons. So of course my, my maybe um, nylon webbing, my nylon tubular cannot be stronger after I sew it than the base strength of the webbing. And one really important point that I'd like to point out is uh, the reproducibility of certain patterns. I've discussed this with many people in the community during the last weeks, and most of them pointed out that you can have your webbing soon at many places right now, um, but many of these um, sewings look different every time that they, ha that they have been produced. What we can see here is a machine uh, by a French slackline company where you can see that 
uh, not a pattern is soon, but a, zig but a zigzag is soon on the uh, on this axis of the webbing. So this machine goes back and forth and just sews a zigzag over here. And you can also see this on this machine um, from a guy in Santi. Santi from Spain, I think. Colombia. Colombia. My mistake. Sorry. And it's the same here. He has uh, a head that does the zigzag, goes over and goes back. The next step of, re of reproducibility would be to sew a bar tag that looks the same every time. The bar tag is sewn on another axis. The machine does the sewing uh, for the person who does the sewing. And the next step of reproducibility would be that the whole pattern is soon at once and is completely reproducible. So what we've seen here is that the whole pattern uh, on the whole area on the webbing is soon in one step and the uh, errors of uh, manual labor are minimized by this. Nevertheless, uh, I just brought one piece of webbing today to this place. I gave it to Elena and my partner sewed it. Uh, I didn't sew it on my own and he sewed it. And uh, he nevertheless managed to make many mistakes in sewing this because he's not... Um, too, um, how to say it, too experienced uh, by using the machine yet. So I have to redo this work. So even if you have a machine that does most parts of the work for you, this does not mean at all that there must be a perfect result in the end. So I think um, we should be careful by giving out webbings for having soon loops in them, in them to people who are not experienced in uh, sewing webbings. We should uh, definitely look out for all the other factors that I mentioned before, like needles, yarns, patterns, etc. Uh, I think the issue is definitely a bit more uh, complex than we might expect. Nevertheless, we managed to uh, develop a pattern that, uh, that uh, if it's done right, uh, shows, uh, shows a strength of about 30 kilonewtons. Uh, and breaks at a little bit more than 30 kilonewtons. I can show it to you here. Our recent goal is to improve the pattern and uh, to bring the strength of this sewing connection higher to gain like about 59 or maybe even 100% of strength in the end. This is what we are doing right now, what we are working on right now. Uh, this is the piece that was tested with a padded loop and a padded soft shackle down here. The soft shackle was padded with uh, MOTM webbing too. Um, and here finally the webbing broke where it's supposed to break in the stitching part, so the webbing itself uh, gave up. We did this test multiple times, so you can see this result is repeatable. The basic um, gain of insight here is that if you connect soft shackles to your soon loops, make sure that the loop is padded, make sure that the soft shackle is well padded, because otherwise the loop breaks at a lower strength than it's supposed to be. What we are doing right now is we um, give our customers the choice to uh, select the backup length for according to the main length, so um, they don't have to work with these extending pieces. So they just can choose between, if they have a, a polyester main and polyester backup, they just say, okay, I have a 50 meter main piece and like a 52.2 or 52.5 meter backup piece. So that's at the moment for us the easiest way to provide backup pieces to connect with uh, the quick links that are going around somewhere like here. What I still want to add when we are talking about soft shackles, uh, we still don't have a solution for the issue of accidental opening of soft shackles if they are in untensioned connections. So this definitely is an issue. If you ask around among sailors, they know this issue. I come from a city, from Rostock, it's at the Baltic Sea. There's many sports sailors 
uh, sailing there and if you talk to these people they know this issue they sometimes have a sail going just flap away because the soft shackle opened up accidentally so this is not something uh, hypothetical this is not not something that might eventually someday happen this is something that happens so we should be aware that if a soft shackle is not loaded this is a potential threat to the safety of uh, the rig we had we had comments on the loop size after the first video that i posted on the soft shackle on loop uh, issue uh, and philip suggested make the loop bigger to test exactly this and on the MOTM test, we had a padded loop with a non-padded uh, soft shackle. And um, what happened is that the soft shackle cut slash melted through the padding at first, and then went on melting through the webbing. So this is what happens when, when, you, have any, when you have a nylon webbing. It's not about um, cutting the fibers because the outer layers are too stressed. It's just like you can see um, I have to look if I have uh, one of the paddings in my car. You can see that the soft shackle just destroys through the padding and just goes on. So thanks for your attention. So basically he came up with the most optimized sewing pattern he possibly could with the space that he has. Um, I don't recommend you trying to copy this pattern if you're trying to get your sewn loops done by um, a random third party. If there are several slackline companies now that will sew your webbing, even if it's not their webbing, which is a really nice service that they offer. You can send pretty much anything to Balance Community uh, in Chicago and they'll sew your loops for you. Loops are the best, best, best thing to have, not just for connecting high lines together with, uh, in this case, a soft shackle, but uh, for rigging your static side, because I put my soft release on the sewn loop and it's just such a simple, clean setup rather than having bulky web locks that you have to tie the tails off and you just get this glob of webbing at your static anchor. As far as the soft shackle on sewn loops debate is concerned, I did learn a few things. He uses a diamond knot, whereas I use a button knot. The diamond knot has the two bunny ears coming out of the top, which means that tails don't go back down, making this diameter a little bit thinner. And so the noose breaks a little bit sooner. They're not as strong. But the point of that is, they're plenty strong for what we do, is the bend radius is not as fat here. The other problem is the Dyneema that he has in his company is I think SK78 with this poly, I won't pretend to know, has a coating on it. It's basically dipped in grease. It's, it's so slippery that tape doesn't stick to it. So his concern that soft shackles would open on their own if jiggled is more of a concern. Uh, whereas I tape mine right here and tape sticks to this SK75 that I like to buy from gotomarine.com. They usually have the best prices, at least in America. Um, and tape does not stick to this. So the closing concern is because he's using a different dyna Dyneema. The brake test concerns are because they were unpadded loops with a different button soft shackle knot. So all that to say, uh, that's a whole different video. We have actually a whole video about soft shackles on sewing loops in our brake test that we got. Uh, you can check that out on our channel. We're gonna do more research on this channel to find out how bad you can do this and not die. Because people are getting sewn loops done by third parties. And I wanna make sure that you don't die trying stuff you probably shouldn't be. So please invest the money in the most important non-redundant thing that you have in your system by sending your webbing to a slackline company to have their stuff done. They've done plenty of tests. Please do not try to sew your own webbing. But even with all the testing that is done, Technically, sewing loops can break. Therefore, you shouldn't highline.